Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats. We're already starting a little bit late. And God forbid I should take some time away from your interesting networking at lunch. Um, I am Andres Alkmanis, and I'd like to introduce, welcome you to this discussion on populism, Euroscepticism, and nationalism. Um, just as a reminder, uh, this session is being broadcast online uh, in the conference webpage, as well as through the Riga conference channel at La Telecom Interactive Television. If you are a Twitter user, don't forget to use the official Riga conference hashtag in your tweets. Also, you can leave your comments on the Lato Facebook page, page's wall, or send them via private message. And I kindly ask all of you, conference guests and online participants alike, to engage actively in the debates. You can submit your questions and comments online at any time, but question and answer session will be opened in about 45 minutes. I would hope that this discussion will help formulate approaches to addressing increasing attacks on liberal democracy and uh, the increasing distrust of politicians and government institutions, both on the European and the national levels. To do so, we of course will have to consider the causes of these problems and their interactions, which feed populism, Euroscepticism, and nationalism, but I hope the focus will be more on possible solutions than on causes. And I'd first like to uh, give very short introductions uh, of our illustrious speakers. Um, you, of course, can read a more in-depth bio in the packet you received from the conference. Dr. Vajrevit Freiberg is president of the Club de Madrid and former president of Latvia. I'm proud to say she is patron of the Isaiah Berlin Association of Latvia. And uh, we must remember and thank her for that in uh, 2006, she initiated uh, the Riga conference and it has now become an annual event. Uh, Wojciech Przybilski is editor-in-chief of Novo, uh, Respublica Nova, a journal of ideas on culture and politics, and of Visegrad Insight, a journal on Central Europe. Um, he recently founded New Europe 100, um, which tries to identify and bring forward future leaders from the region empowered by the digital age. Dr. Erka Railo is Senior fellow, Research Fellow at the Center for Parliamentary Studies at the University of Turku in Finland. The main focus of his research has been the changing relationship between politics and media, and in particular, the influence of the media on the recent rise in the popularity of populist parties. And our final speaker, after two years as Deputy Foreign Minister of Poland, Ambassador Jerzy Pomianowski, became Executive Director of the newly founded European Endowment for Democracy in 2013. He's had an illustrious career in the Foreign Ministry in Poland and was Ambassador to Japan uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, here we'll uh, move beyond the inside of Europe into the uh, eastern and southern neighborhood and globally at that point. Um, in an article in Visegrad Insight this spring, Ivan Krastev reflects on the relevance of today, uh, to today, of Raymond Aron's book In Defense of Decadent Europe, published in 1977 a time of pessimism and doubt about the future of both democracy and of Europe. Aron's book gives us a better sense of the crisis, but today's crisis is a different crisis. 
Now, when communism is history, Krastev writes, how should we write in defense of decadent Europe? The European Union no longer exists, at least not as we know it. All of the pillars that served to build and justify the existence of the EU have collapsed. We now have to contend with a generation that has nothing to do with the history of Hitler and the Second World War. Today, the conviction that the EU continues to derive legitimacy from its roots in the war is an illusion. Today, continues Krastev, the EU does not have an enemy that can justify its existence in the same manner as post-1949 Soviet communism did. The third pillar that has crumbled is prosperity. The EU continues to be very rich, even if this observation does not apply to all its member states. However, 60% of Europeans believe that their children will not live as well as they do. Another source of legitimacy was a belief in convergence, which led poor countries joining the EU to expect that they would progressively acquire advantages in tune with membership of a rich man's club. This still, has some base, this still had some basis, in fact, a few years ago. But today, if the economic forecasts for the next 10 years are to be believed, a country like Greece is likely to remain as poor in comparison to Germany as it was on the day of its accession to the EU. In the world's rising ideological cycle, liberalism is in retreat. Indeed, ethnic nationalism and religion are not only ever more present in the non-European world, they are also more present within Europe itself. Um, the crisis has put post-national politics on trial. It has evoked collective national experiences and revived national narratives long thought shut up in metaphorical archives. We live in Europe today from the one described by Aron, concludes Ivan Krastev. We must, therefore, face the question of if we want to defend it and how. So far, the question remains open. Madam President, do you think that Ivan Krastev has got it right? And if so, what, if anything, should be done? The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Anders. Uh, good morning or good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, frankly, uh, since I left the academic scene, I've given up the habit of relying on quotations and responding to them. And I think uh, citizens in general uh, should take on that a habit of not responding to quotations or affirmations by others, but thinking on their own feet. I like to think that I learned to do that, if nothing else, in my long life. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> if you'll forgive me, I'll start simply from the beginning, which is the title of this session. Uh, we have three, uh, three concepts you have identified, and they are presented to us uh, I perceive them as something of a three-headed dragon uh, that is threatening uh, Europe and its survival and its future. The, what is the common thread among them? Uh, it seems this aura of negativity about them. Uh, uh, this aura of despair almost that you did um, try to depict in your quotation uh, and that doubt about the future. That being the common element, my question is, what is it about these three concepts that unites them? And where do they come from? And why are they looming over our collective heads as some kind of alternative to what we had before? Well, I think the alternative that we had before was indeed a consensus. There was a general consensus in which what is now the European Union uh, was, uh, first of all, founded uh, very modestly uh, many years ago. Um, it continued to evolve in what seemed to be an extremely positive direction in terms of reconciliation, uh, putting resources in common uh, rather than fighting over them, win-win situations rather than zero-sum games, peace and uh, collaboration among nations uh, rather than endless wars such as Europe had seen, 
uh, before that. And indeed, in 1991 or in 89, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and then the collapse of the Soviet Union, we had a vision of a world that would not be divided in two ideologies that had to confront each other and had to see each other in um, as, as mirror images and uh, negative mirror images and enemies of each other. All that having disappeared, then, what is it that uh, remains behind? Well, human nature remains behind, uh, human society remains behind. Uh, we are, uh, ever since uh, the French Revolution, or indeed since the ancient Greeks, there has been this movement of trying to define what a human being is and what the rights they have, or indeed who and what is a human being. The, our lovely ancient Greeks, with their first uh, seeds of democracy, did not consider slaves as human beings, nor did they admit uh, to their political process people who were not born in Athens and who were not uh, bona fide Athenians. That remains something that lasts for several uh, thousands of years until our present current day. Who is a human being? Who is a citizen? Who has a right to decide? And I think that the second part is that we are also pack animals. We are collective beings. We do create societies and we live in societies. And the thing is that the paradox of it is uh, that if uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau thought that society is something that is imposed on our nature from outside, it is somehow something nasty and, and, and unpleasant, a shackles uh, that the free spirit has to endure and against which they have to fight and go back to nature to, to see the full flowering of their inner being and their inner soul, well, then uh, society in many ways is what forms as a social beings and we would be desperate and except for some hermits who are the exception that confirms the rule, we like to be in societies, we like to feel that others share our values and our conceptions of the world. And it is this security then that people look for. They look at physical security, that they will not be uh, throttled, uh, they will not have their throats cut, that bombs will not fall on their threads, that tanks will not invade their territory, that they can rely on leading their lives without threat from inside. They look forward to stability, so that they will not be attacked by their fellow citizens, uh, be it in the dark street at midnight or generally uh, in the light of day, in uh, uh, confrontations, be they political or economic. And they look to something that I think is forgotten all this um, debate uh, in which Europe was formed, it's the individual, the identity of both nations and individuals. I think that the, the oratory, the, the rhetoric, uh, the formulation of the goals of, of the Europe we are building somehow took many things for granted. And what current populations are discovering, that there's somewhere there's a vacuum. There's a vacuum in a place where people build up their identity as individuals and social beings. And they, they hear this siren call from various, from various quarters who come to fill that vacuum. And that vacuum is quickly filled by various uh, movements that you have called by these derogatory names and that we indeed, many of us, and I join that, I'm in that number, uh, consider as essentially having elements of danger to them. But what I think we should focus on and never forget is that people do not act at random. They act with motivation. They have reasons for acting so. If they are attracted to something, it means that it rewards them. It offers them something that they find valuable. Worse, it offers them something that is missing in their lives and that alternatives had not somehow managed to fulfill. And when we're talking about the failure of democracy or of, of the European project, etc., etc., we should really be looking at what do we mean by it? What is it about democracy that has failed or what remains still and will hopefully remain forever? We have to be careful not to throw out the baby with the bathwater, which I think too often is done. I think I'll stop here for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Um, a good question. Mm -hmm. What is it about democracy that has failed? And uh, as well, the vacuum that needs to be filled, and many people are offering to fill this vacuum in many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, for the different ways um, of, of uh, democracy, uh, I'll turn to my 
uh, next speaker. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, for one, am trying to move into the academic, back into the academic sphere, so I will once again quote an article. <laughs> <laughs> After the replacement of technocrat Mario Monti as uh, Prime Minister of Italy with Matteo Renzi and his primacy in politics, uh, Marco Valerio Loprete addressed the question of more democratic participation versus technocratic competence in an article entitled is Viktor Orban right that liberal democracy has failed? Is Italy exhibit number one? The author notes that the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, has argued that, and I quote, liberal democratic societies cannot remain globally competitive because their decision-making mechanisms are anachronistic. As Orban sees it, the alternative is to build what he calls an illiberal democratic state. And this, he posited, is not a personal whim, and I quote, today the world tries to understand systems which are not Western, not liberal, maybe not even democracies, yet they are successful. And then he mentioned Singapore, China, Russia, and Turkey as examples. Sociologist Luca Ricolfi has responded to Orban's assertions in the following manner, I quote, the issue brought up by Orban about the dysfunction of our democracies is not so politically incorrect. Furthermore, Ricolfi wondered about the capacity of our political systems to integrate economic development, social cohesion, and democracy, and still be able to make decisions. For Ricolfi, the situation has reached the point where it is impossible to undertake reforms. Political analyst Nathan Gardels, Gardels has warned that illiberal nationalist democracy of the kind proposed by Orban will inevitably arise as an attractive alter alternative if Western democracies continue to pretend that nothing is changing, going on without any self-criticism and without evolving in a way that combines and what is necessary, he says, one must combine more democratic participation with more meritocratic competence. I find two issues of interest here, Mr. Shibilski. Are the results of the recent EU parliamentary elections, as well as other elections at the national level, indicative of rising support for Orban's illiberal vision? And two, is Garbell's alternative of more democratic participation with more meritocratic competence viable? The floor is yours. Thank you. I'm really thrilled to be invited to be at this panel and address the issue. However, you, you, you have to, um, and I, I guess in the questions that will be obvious that we all are in the midst and uh, we search for the same answers from similar position. I think there is a, starting from the, from the first question uh, about EU election, there is a niche, and perhaps a growing niche, uh, that is being filled by those who claim that uh, liberal democracy has failed. Uh, and, and we see these uh, parties winning popular support, uh, also promising to unite somehow in the European scene, which is a paradox. I mean, the parties that are, that are recently climbing in the um, um, popularity polls and win some votes uh, want to be in the European Parliament for exactly anti-European sentiment uh, or for, the, uh, for, the, for their own anti-sentiment reason. And of course they build their momentum uh, based on that, they build their political structures um, because they are in the EU Parliament. UKIP party is an example uh, Le Pen's party is an example, and various parties from, from uh, Eastern Europe or other parts of Europe are an example. However, it's interesting to see that they didn't come to, a, uh, uh, to uh, any cooperation as they intended. But let's uh, go a step back and think of why there is a niche 
and why uh, the people are voting for such parties. And I would not discredit the people. In other words, um, let's come back to the quote of, uh, of Brecht, who, um, who was uh, mentioning, mentioning that if you're unhappy with the role of the people, just re-elect the people. That was 1953 um, uh, revolts in Eastern Germany when he, he was writing that. Well, you, you have to you have to think of what, what is the needs of the people, and I, I practically agree with what uh, Madam President has said. This is the essential part, what people need in their basis, the three principles that you, you named are important. Um, but it's also, I think, there is a some certain other aspect that people expect, and that is aspect of, of truth, truthness, or less hypocrisy. For some reason, when the European Constitution project has been voted, some nations have been asked to re-vote again until they finally uh, agree uh, to, to adapt the, the Constitution. Uh, and there are more practices like this, even with the banking crisis and the, the, um, uh, the, the crisis with the, of the, of the uh, unregulated ba banking system, we see that people again might feel cheated, by the rules that should be the principles of liberal democracy. So I would state here, and just for, to remind everyone, uh, that while we were debating values uh, when the European Constitution project was um, debated, this is not about values, the Europe is not about that much about values, as much about principles. The liberal democracy is also about the principles. And what, when those principles are being broken, then the feeling of insecurity or lack of stability may incline people to see politics as just a theater. To support that, I would come back to the example of Estonia, uh, 2010, when a theater called NO99 um, made a fake theater performance, the largest of that kind in Europe, where 7,000 people came because the theater announced uh, a new party, United Estonia, feeding on all the nationalist, Eurosceptic, you name it, uh, sentiments or resentments uh, there are um, across the Europe. Just in three months or so, or maybe even two months, uh, they gather a crowd and attention all of all media, potentially building up a momentum for a political um, a po a political uh, result in, in, the, in the parliament. Fortunately, that was fake. And then it was dismantled uh, in a, in a, uh, in a, with an with a Estonian sense of humor there. Mm -hmm. um, but there is, a, there is an interesting observation, and there is an observation case you can make out of it, that really there is ver it's very easy to build up this um, nationalistic, Eurosceptic, or whatever else party which criticizes um, uh, European liberal, liberal democracy model or European democracy model. I think there is, there, there is again, something uh, to be considered or reconsider what Europe is about, because we have to practically understand that throughout Europe there is not a feeling of nationalism, um, not a feeling of Euroscepticism that much, but there is a feeling of inwardness. People look to the, si to, to the inside, to the particular aspect of their societies. And we're losing the, the principle, with the principles, we're losing the universal approach to what we want to achieve. And people see that and they look back inwards rather than outwards and uh, to the universal principles. So on that feeling, the nationalists, the Eurosceptic parties are being built. They use or abuse the, the concepts that la they are laid at the foundations of Europe. Solidarity principle, look at the programs and the rhetorics of every parties that we're talking about. There is solidarity of our people. There is freedom, which, lies, uh, which, which is underlying uh, European project. But the parties that we're talking about and uh, the political movements, they're saying freedom of our people. And um, there are human rights um, of our people. So the biggest and the, the, the most important uh, task, in a sense, is to restore confidence in the principles the European project and the national democracies are based. 
And here I would just end with the question mark um, of an academic, uh, Calypso Nicolaidis, who is the head of um, European um, uh, project, uh, European studies at, at, uh, at Oxford right now, uh, and her concept of democracies uh, that she raised in 2004, exactly around the Constitution project. Look into, look at Europe as a way, as a, as a space where there are many democracies, as you have to understand the variety of them and accept the, this variety in their in their um, want, in their need to be together as Europeans. And, and that's, I, I think, a good starting point, not the end of discussion uh, for, to answer your questions. Thank you. Um, now we'll move on to new phenomena. Uh, the phenomena of popular protest on a much higher and intensive level, and new forms of political parties. Perhaps they're new forms of political parties. <coughs> Excuse me. Podemos, or Podemos, we can, has been called a radical left sensation, born out of the ashes of the indignados, the outraged, whose success is yet another example of modern technopolitics, or, as some experts have put it, the power of the connected multitudes. Podemos, a new party established in March of this year, disrupted Spain's political scene when it swept up five seats out of 54 and 1.2 million votes in the European elections in May, even though it was only 100 days old. Um, it has more online fans than any other Spanish political party. Founded by left-wing academics and led by a 35-year-old political science lecturer, Pablo Iglesias, Podemos' platform strongly advocates for anti-corruption and transparency issues, is supportive of participatory democracy, and critical of the two main Spanish parties, as well as the government's austerity measures. Podemos is considered an offshoot of 15M, a tech-savvy group that from 2011 to 12 protested against the country's political inefficacy high unemployment, and other political and economic woes. Uh, Podemos' popularity was made possible in part by its roots in 15M, as well as the charismatic and media-savvy leadership of Iglesias and the party's ability to mobilize the youth, unemployed, and voters that tend to abstain. The party's success also has been seen to come from deep changes to the way politics has been done, a combination of bold reforms and use of technology to make the decision-making process as inclusive and transparent as possible. Now, Podemos has a plan and it has goals, but increasingly there are protest movements across the globe that do not. Once again, Ivan Krastev, and this is from his latest book, Democracy Disrupted, the Politics of Global Protest, reflects on the complex relationship between mass protests and democracy, and analyzes how mass protests are transforming democracy. In the three short years between Occupy Wall Street and Vladimir Putin's Occupy Crimea, we witnessed an explosion of protests around the world, the Arab Spring, Russian winter, Turkish summer, and the dismembering of Ukraine, all were part of the protest movement, Krastev writes. And such protests are increasingly occurring in Europe, Bulgaria, Greece, Spain, for example. Now, a number of questions arise from the protest and the Podemos phenomena. Do the protests signal a radical change in the way politics will be practiced? Do the protests prove, the technologically, prove that the technologically amplified powers of citizens? Will it be the empowering energy of the protests or the conservative backlash against them that will shape the future of democratic politics? Can the Spanish party Podemos, along with the pirate parties in Northern Europe, be considered as a new type of political party? Dr. Rairo, 
you have the floor. Thank you. No, Dr. Uh, Idle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. Um, Podemos, indeed, um, is similar to many other uh, populist movements in, in Europe. Um, its ability to use social media to uh, gain credibility, gain visibility, is important. It's anti-elitist party, uh, and it's a left, leftist party, as, as you mentioned. So it has many of the same characteristics as other populist parties in, in, in Europe. Uh, yet at the same time, I would like to say that, that these new sometimes new, sometimes not so new populist parties in Europe are uh, relatively, I, I would say, that their uh, influence or the threat they pose is exaggerated. Uh, I do not, they, they do challenge in, in many ways the European project. They uh, sometimes they challenge the uh, democratic values of Europe that unites us. But even that did not, is not always the case. What comes to the European parliamentary elections to the European Union and European Parliament is it, it is a big paradox that actually European Parliament inadvertently gives room and visibility to these kind of parties who are able to bypass the, the problems uh, they, these populist parties are facing in the, in the national political scene and enter the European Parliament into an institution which they vehemently oppose. And what happens when these parties get into the European Parliament, they again, through that institution, they get visibility and credibility. And I think this visibility and credibility is perhaps one of the reasons we at the moment feel somewhat un insecure or pessimistic about the European future. But I do think that, that we don't need to be pessimistic about the European future. I do not think the populist parties uh, in Europe pose a long-term threat to the European project. There are several reasons to that. But uh, let me take an, a, a quick example uh, of this. In 2011, a Finns party in Finland, a populist right-wing, sometimes called right-wing party, won one-fifth of, uh, of the votes in uh, parliamentary elections. Now, there were two reasons for, to put it very briefly, there, there were two reasons for the victory of this party. First of all, uh, during, we have been a member of the European Union for about 20 years, since 1995. And during that period, there has been consistently about 25 to 30 percent of Finns who have disliked the European Union. Uh, but they have, ha they have not had a, a, a legitimate, credible representation in the Finnish parliament. But now, suddenly, in a matter of a few years, the, the support of a, this anti-European party rose from 4% to 19%. So what happened? What gave credibility to Finn's party? And I think this is an example that tells a lot about the support and the weaknesses also of these populist parties in Europe. What happened shortly was the financial crisis of the Europe, in the European Union. In 2009-2010, uh, there was a lot of talk about the overdebted countries in the southern Europe, Greece and Portugal, for example, mostly about Greece and Portugal. And the Finnish media 
has always been pro-European. But during that time, the Finnish media was very critical towards the Finnish political mainstream parties. They were very critical towards the European Union because they thought that the European Union is handling the crisis the wrong way. Basically, to put it bluntly, taking away the money from, from Finland and giving it to the countries that have, have not taken care of their businesses properly. So the Finnish taxpayers are paying for the Greek and Portuguese debts. That was basically the message of the Finnish media. And also some of the politicians, mainstream politicians said the same thing. That basically, okay, we don't want to do this, but you know, we have to because we are a member state of the European Union. So this gave credibility to the populist True Finns Party, or the Finns Party later changed its name, the Finns Party, because the Finns Party has consistently said that the European project is a failure, that the Eurozone is a failure, that it will lead to the collapse of the European financial system. And in the spring of 2011, it almost seemed as Timo Soini, the leader of the party, was actually correct that the Eurozone will fall apart, as he had been saying for 15 years at the time. So this, this gave incredible, in, incredible credibility, legitimacy to the Finns party. Uh, but, okay, these are the, basically the two reasons why the two Finns made so good progress, that there was an anti-European sentiment and the media was able to drum that up inadvertently, though, to the elections. But at the same time, this tells me how this tells us how to solve what is the future of the populist. This is a, this is a populist challenge, yes, but at the same time, it gives us two advice on how to counter the populist challenge. One is obvious. We have to uh, have better policies in place. The European Union has to make better policies, and I, I think we'll come to that later. But basically, the fruits of European, uh, fruits of European integration have, have, have not been shared equally between people. And I, I think we have to face that at some point. Uh, these frugal policies we have been, been implementing over the few years perhaps been necessary, but at some point we have to take into account the fact that, that there is a discrepancy here. Okay, and the second point is that we have to stop blaming Brussels for, for our problems. Now, at the same time, in 2011, 11, I was reading also Irish newspapers and see what they have to say. Now, Ireland had been, had been over the country as well. It was hoping to get money from the European Union so as to cope with the financial burdens of the country. Now, what did they write about the European Union? They were blaming the European Union for not giving money quickly enough. So, at the same time, the Finnish press was saying European Union is stealing our money. And, 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 and the Irish press was saying the European Union is not giving us money quickly enough. So it's easy enough for the politicians and the media to say that, OK, Brussels is the problem. OK, I'll, I think I'll uh, stop here. Thank you. Um, in the last four years, events in the EU's eastern and southern neighborhoods have been tumultuous and may have implications for the future of democracy. Ambassador Pomianowski, is there anything that we can learn from these events that might benefit the strengthening of the European Union or that of liberal democracy in the member states? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Andrews, very much. And I'm very happy to be here with you. And I first need to say sorry and apologize because I will spoil this wonderful panel by uh, bringing over all present subjects here, Putin and Russia. 
to the panel that until now there was single mention Russia and Putin. Mm -hmm. But I promise, being a Pole, I will do this softly and I will do this to minimum extent possible. So, uh, indeed, uh, our internal uh, problems, discussions, uh, tensions, uh, they do have influence uh, outside of Europe and they do influence uh, uh, to a large extent also uh, the discussion and the dilemmas that are, uh, that are accompanying uh, people there. But at the same time, of course, the situation in, uh, in those countries and, uh, and their leaderships, they do influence uh, our discussions uh, in Europe. So uh, what I would like to, uh, uh, to, to start is uh, to say that it is extremely important to uh, understand uh, the European crisis from the, a little bit larger perspective. If uh, uh, those from you, same as me, we are living in the uh, Eastern uh, Soviet bloc in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 60s, we were hearing all the time that the Europe is in a crisis, uh, the West is in crisis, it's falling apart. It's absolutely not able to survive the next five years. And the protests of 68, uh, 70s, the crises uh, in US and in Western Europe were demonstrating uh, that it's actually true. Although we did not believe uh, the propaganda, still uh, uh, the arguments uh, were quite strong. But what was the reaction of those societies that were still outside of this uh, uh, world in crisis? We were dreaming to join this crisis. Mm -hmm. And this is the case for the European neighborhood now. The people in Egypt, people in Moldova, they are saying, uh, please, we would like to share your crisis. Mm -hmm. We would like to be in the same situation as Greece to receive 100 billions of euros of assistance. What we are saying to Ukrainians, 7 billions, 11, and the Greece, three times, four times small country receives 100, so we would like to have such a crisis. Please, take us. So the perspective and uh, our perception of the crisis and dilemmas depends uh, from which point you look at it. And that's extremely important to understand when we are talking about uh, crisis in Europe. I would be far from uh, uh, underestimating, as you said, it's exaggerated, uh, but still uh, I would be far from saying there is no uh, uh, a crisis uh, in Europe. But the crisis or uh, the skepticism, I strongly believe, is an imminent part of our freedom of speech, of our freedom to act, of our freedom to think what is right, what is wrong. What is troublesome, it is of course uh, an external uh, element in the whole uh, puzzle that Europe is uh, facing. And here, unfortunately, as I said, I, I need to bring a, a little bit of, of uh, um, President Putin uh, to our discussion. If we look into simple definition of, uh, of uh, populism, uh, what basically says that there is no definition, but there are several recurrent uh, features. And one of them is uh, it promotes uh, direct democracy, claims direct link between government and the people. So what Putin is doing actually, he is uh, saying uh, to us and to the world uh, that actually popularity controlling media is an excellent substitution of so-called democracy, enough to be popular, to basically solve all questions about uh, credibility and, uh, and validity of the government. Direct relation between people and the government. That was exactly how we define, following the Tocqueville famous uh, uh, analysis, in our system in the Eastern Bloc saying what the communist system wanted. The communist system wanted to have a citizen in front of the state machine. So direct lean between government and citizen without institutions that are supporting individual and group needs, that are protecting individual and group rights, 
all this plethora of the civil society mechanisms and institutions, that is something that potentially can uh, destroy this pleasant link between citizen and uh, a government that only is built on simple popularity, on simple referendum, uh, not on real choice and not on merit uh, discussion. The second uh, uh, feature of the populism is uh, it offers immediate and demagogical solution to people's day-to-day -day problems. So, Russian economy is not doing very well. The solution is war. The solution is sanctions. Sanctions are making our situation not so good. So again, we have a use of this very simple mechanism in our neighborhood that try to explain to the people what's, uh, 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 or how they should understand their day-to-day -day, uh, problems. Why I am now trying to make this uh, uh, reduction of the populism to the, to the specific uh, uh, country and leader policies? Because it is infectious. It is infectious also to the leaders in uh, Europe, because the leaders in Europe, political leaders, political activists, they are not free from this uh, temptation um, to use a good pattern, uh, well promoted, uh, and in a, in a sense also admired by any, saying, you see, you can run the country like this, and you can achieve a very strange goals, and the West is not reacting. It means it is possible to achieve your political and even military goals uh, uh, within this framework. And at the same time, if we look how we in Europe behave in front, for example, of Egypt now, when we are repeating the same mistake we did repeat many years ago, when we are trading off democracy and uh, uh, human rights for regional stability, for the sake of having no more problems, the situation in Egypt is deteriorating dramatically. Have you heard any strong statements about this? Are you watching a discussion within Europe? I mean, the countries who are specifically sensitive to the Mediterranean, how they are now reacting. Everybody is focused on Iraq, which is very important. The fighting terrorists is extremely important. But the situation is, in Egypt is deteriorating. The human rights situation is deteriorating. And the military rule there does not give any promise for improvement and more democracy and human rights. So if they see this, of course, doubts are coming. What you offer to us, what really is a Europe? And that is exactly the very good ground for Eurosceptics and populists in Europe, because they say, well, that's exactly our policy. So we are at least honest. We say it bluntly. And those guys from traditional parties, they are trying to cover up their hypocritical approaches. So here, the answer is, Either we are honest to ourselves or not. And that's the answer to the people, because if we do make choices that are not so pleasant, we have to say it to the people, not try to hide it behind some kind of hypocritical routine. So I don't want to, uh, uh, to, to talk too much on this, because it's a huge subject for the separate, uh, separate panel. But what I want to say is that, first of all, our internal discussions as much they are honest, and as much we will address the issues within Europe honestly, but in the context not only of the Europe inside, this inward looking, but also we will compare the situation of the people living in Europe to the situation living outside of Europe. And in this context, we will try to apply uh, similar and the uh, same uh, measures and values that will eventually also help our internal discussion. And the second thing is, and this is example of Poland, of new members of the European Union, if we keep Europe open, if we have this ability to invite those who are dreaming about our crisis, that is also bringing inside Europe more people They are believing in Europe, more people they are really committed to it. And that is exactly one of the answers with which we are trying to say, let's be open, let's keep enlargement as an option, not saying that for next five years there will be no enlargement, saying could be, could be, just we have to, we have to understand. Because those people who will be coming to Europe, they will bring new energy, new trust, new commitment to our values that we are sometimes having so many doubts about them. Thank you. Um, populism is infectious. Uh, be honest and keep Europe open.
those were the three things I, I just heard. Um, I would like to ask one last question and to all of you uh, that comes out of actually uh, Ambassador Pominovsky's comments about Putin. And that's about an internal European affair, or not. Uh, and that's Viktor Orban and Hungary as an example. If we're talking about, uh, you know, populism and things being infectious, um, is it not a greater threat that actually one of our own, one of the European Union, is uh, bringing into life and actually advocating uh, what he calls illiberal democracy. Is that infectious? And uh, should we do anything about it? Would anyone like to comment on this? Madam President. Again, I'd like to um, possibly pose the question in a somewhat broader context. And it's the two elements we've heard so far in discussion that Europe has a deficit of democracy, and that is that the population does not feel sufficiently empowered and participatory uh, uh, and responsible for uh, the decision making. And the other is a deficit of leadership. Uh, we hear that Europe, alas, has a severe deficit of leadership. And you get this picture of uh, European uh, citizens stumbling along like uh, lost and bleating sheep without a shepherd. Uh, no idea uh, what uh, their future is to bring to them. Uh, not being led or inspired by anybody. Whereas our neighbor to the east are so blessed, you see, uh, with a heroic leader, uh, bare-chested, um, exposing his manly pectoral muscles and flexing his, his biceps in, in attacking neighboring uh, territories and, and presenting to us that virile, uh, magical, attractive image of, of true leadership as one somehow likes to think of it. And uh, the poor European sheep, in, in uh, contrast, are sort of wandering about blindly, uh, now voting uh, for a donkey or a dog or a clown, um, rejecting my good friend uh, Mario Monti as, as a technocrat, when Mario Monti is a very, very smart man, uh, extremely uh, acutely experienced in financial matters, and, and uh, I must say a, a terrific uh, democrat and gentleman uh, to boot. Well, uh, but yes, what do these popular movements, what do they show us? Podemos in Spanish means, yes, we can. It comes from the wor verb poder, which means power. And when the Spaniards are saying, we want as citizens, we want power, one of the things they're worrying about is their future. And I think uh, Ambassador and others here have pointed out the intimate relationship between economic prospects of people, their sense of identity, their sense of security, and their sense of participating in a democracy. If Spain has over 50% youth unemployment, and has, this has been lasting for some years, obviously, especially the youth, are going to be concerned about never mind living better than their parents or grandparents, but what kind of future they have, what at all. I've just come from Andorra, where, curiously enough, people are extremely proud of the fact that all 30,000 of them, uh, plus all the uh, guest uh, uh, workers whom they uh, have there, I think 70,000 population. For something like 800 years, the Andorans have managed uh, to maneuver between uh, the great powers, France uh, and Spain, uh, and retain their independence. And this is the very moment when in Catalonia, they're about to go to, uh, to a referendum. And what have they chosen as the anthem? for uh, their, uh, the country they're hoping to have, this movement of nationalism. They've chosen Martin Brown, a Latvian composer, very patriotic and lovely melody, very touching and very moving for Latvians ever since it was uh, written and continues to be performed uh, since our movement of independence. And the Catalonians have, have set that melody uh, to the words of, of their, what they consider, a national poet, and the words start out with saying, ahora es la hora, now is the hour, now is the moment. And what is the moment? It's the moment when we plant our trees and make them grow. And the symbol of the growing tree, I think, is very, very striking. 
the people want to feel that there is a prospect. When you plant an acorn, you mentally already have a picture of an oak that it will become. Uh, there is, in things that you do, you'd like to see a perspective, a future, a meaning, a sense. And planting a tree is a deeply symbolic way of saying what I am doing today has a meaning. What I am doing with my hands or with my being has consequences. People wish to feel empowered. Podemos, yes we can, is the uh, battle cry of those who feel disenfranchised. By the way, rightly or wrongly, economically, it's only too sad and too true that many people are disenfranchised and the future, uh, both in Western, Southern, Eastern Europe, wherever, uh, for many of them there is a doubt. Uh, but the, the other doubt about is about their sense of who they are, what is their identity, their heritage. I think in traveling uh, across Europe and the world, by the way, but the, the sense that I get from the, the populations is that they really appreciate their sense of common humanity, of belonging uh, to a uh, common human race. I had uh, South African business women cry uh, at the very, uh, my very presence at being with them on a Sunday morning to discuss with them their double problems that when they suffered apartheid under the whites and uh, the discrimination as women under the blacks. The sense of common humanity is very much present. We tend to forget that. But at the same time, people like to feel that they have an identity, that they have an identity uh, as Greeks, as Finns, uh, or as Italians, uh, as, as uh, Scots, uh, or as uh, Catalonians, or as Basques. It is frequently a regional identity. Uh, uh, it is something uh, that gives them a sense of belonging. My message and has been and will continue to be that such identities are extremely important. These are the roots out of which the tree of civilization can grow and then a tree of common, uh, of common society and common democracy. Uh, but it must have the freedom to flourish, if you like, in its own soil, uh, in its own guise. Uh, if you start uh, trying to make all trees equal, and this is where I think that Versailles and the, and the classical French style of gardening, I'm, I'm an abduct of the English garden, you see, uh, and um, I find these um, pleached and, and, and uh, shorn trees all lined up in a row uh, somehow make me think of, of maybe this idea of Europe, the cookie-cutter Europe, where everybody is going to be uh, a sort of nondescript European wearing the same jeans, the same t-shirt, the, uh, the same brand of American or Japanese or Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese shoes, and this is going to be our new European who's going to be completely faceless uh, in terms of his past and of his roots. I, if the Andorans, all 25 or 30,000 of them, are so proud of where they are rooted in their valley, in their two valleys in the Pyrenees, they are not alone. I, I've, I've had people from the Piemont whom, to whom I talked about their roots, I mean, the, you know, the regional roots and the meaning to people, they were saying, we are ready to vote for you as our European Parliament deputy, if, if that's the way you see our common Europe. So I think what, the, what has been on offer uh, from, from politicians is too often has been uh, either cliches that need to be revived uh, or possibly um, a, a lack of sensitivity to what people are all about. The creation of fictitious parties, we had one here in Latvia. Uh, when it was announced some years ago during my presidency that every party before the elections would have equal television time, that's democracy, isn't it? Uh, I remember seeing on television for a full 10 minutes uh, that they were allotted, a new party being created by, by a certain gentleman who had rented uh, the Dial Theatre, had hung up a Latvian flag, and all by his lonesome self stood there in front of the cameras, uh, desperately trying to say something sensible for the 10 minutes that he had been allotted on television. And uh, uh, that, uh, apart from uh, many other things, uh, made our televisions actually change their, their policy. Now we don't have any television appearances a full month before the elections, that's falling in the other extreme. But what I mean by this is that it, participatory democracy is a work in progress. We do not have a ready-made 
you know, like a Greek statue uh, of the Venus of Milo or, or some uh, image of perfection, uh, that we have, this is participatory dem democracy, this is how we do it, uh, let's all do the same thing and we'll be fine. People wish to have the freedom to dress their Venus in the clothes of their local region. They wish to have a way of formulating their own sense of Europeanness in their own way. And they get disinformed. If in Russia they get disinformed about the heroic uh, powers uh, and, uh, and the putative greatness of, of the nation that he is ensuring for them, let me assure you that when you said we will have a referendum until we get the right answers, the referendum they had in Ireland, I was there just after it, and people were telling me we voted because on the radio there was this millionaire who was spreading disinformation saying abortions would become compulsory, we would have compulsory military service, we would we send the wars and so on. Uh, we wouldn't have uh, the freedom to be strong Catholics, etc., etc. And all of it nonsense, all of it lies, and yet people were being presented it. Do, have you seen the latest news about the young lady who claimed to go, where was it, to Thailand or something, and with Photoshop? Uh, filled the internet, the social media, with pictures of her happy holiday under the palm trees, on the, uh, on the sandy beaches and so on. It was all Photoshop work and she never went anywhere at all except in front of her computer. Imagine now a world built on disinformation. Whom are we to trust and whom are we to know? I Thank think we you, have Madam to think President. about information as well. Thank you, Madam President. I will now uh, open up the floor. I will now open up the floor to questions and we'll start, ah, I guess we're starting with the left side this time. Uh, please mention your name, introduce yourself, and short questions, short commentary. We'll take three. Thank you. Uh, Nadia Arbatova, Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, I have a very short comment and I cannot agree with Mr. Pominovsky, that Russian populism is infections for European Union. Russia is responsible for many sins and things, but not for the EU populism, because it has completely different roots. And uh, the populism in the EU countries uh, is a net product of the EU mistakes the growing gap between Brussels and ordinary citizens, the failure of multicultural project, which was recognized by the leaders of France, Germany, and UK, and um, the impact of the economic and financial crisis. In times of crisis, people always feel insecure and are prone to believe to those who promise a very easy recipes. So uh, that is my uh, uh, short uh, comment. In Russia, the roots of populism are completely different. Thank you. Uh, who else? Ah, we have two questions right here. Thank you. I'm Giri Gandalaki from Georgian Opposition. Ivan Krastev in his earlier article has even better term to describe these actors, uh, democracies doubles, actors that are camouflaged in democratic wrapping, uh, so to speak. Uh, and these actors obviously exist not only inside the EU, but also outside in the Eastern neighborhood in countries with much weaker traditions. And due to this weakness of democratic traditions or checks and balances, in some cases, these actors can even come to power and cause backsliding of democracy. Uh, so my question would be, uh, what can the EU, because obviously they are less uh, potential to absorb these parties in the system, because the system is, in itself is very weak. So the question is, what can the EU do to help the new democracies tackle uh, such actors uh, in its eastern neighborhood? Thank you. Thank you. So what can we help? How can we help the new democracies? Um, and there was another question right here. Michael Salim from Sweden. Again, um, I'm not going to talk about the elections tomorrow, but they will <laughs> deal a lot with migration issues yes. uh, and the rise of populist parties, perhaps, and consequences in Sweden. I was slightly, uh, I was missing in the panel discussion 
the, the variable, the dimensions of migration as an issue of populism, nationalism, etc., etc. It's a huge issue in Sweden because we are very, very open and we're not competing with anyone, but we are asking kindly for EU solidarity. And secondly also, Madam President mentioned uh, her love for English gardens, and I share that completely. Uh, the Scots seem less fond of English <laughs> gardens, so uh, uh, the, I was wondering what the panel thinks about the dimension of the risks of partition of various, you mentioned Catalonia and, and their national anthem, which makes me remember Biafra having the Finlandia of Sibelius as their national anthem at the time. So the, pa the question is, what do you think about the dimension of migration pressure and, and uh, the risk of partition of, I mean, the UK perhaps even leaving the EU as we know in the next step, and then there is Catalonia. That dimension, two dimensions, thank you. Thank you, uh, and I have a question here from our from cyberspace, and uh, what should minority groups do when parties like UKIP, UKIP, Jobbik, etc. rise? They are the ones that suffer the most. How to protect them? So that's a fourth Sorry, question. Who, who to protect? How, uh, what should minority, minority groups do under conditions of, of UKIP, with the rise of UKIP and Jobbik and parties like that? Okay, that's, we have four questions. Let's start with Ambassador Pomianowski. I guess uh, I will just comment to comment. Uh, thanks uh, for the uh, Moscow uh, Russian Academy of Science uh, comment. But as usually happened to my Russian colleagues, you stopped in the most interesting part of your comment. What is actually the root of the populism in Russia? You said what is populism uh, in uh, roots in Europe, uh, but I would like to know what is the uh, roots of populism uh, in Russia, in your perception. I remember, uh, let me say if you, just an anecdote, when I was still at the university in the 70s and 80s, we had a compulsory military uh, kind of special course. And in this course, we are learning how many tanks Denmark has. And I was always asking the colonel who was teaching us, and how many tanks do we have? Oh, no, that's a secret. You cannot know it. You can only know how much NATO has tanks. So that reminds me a little bit of this approach. So we have no now time, uh, but I would be very happy to hear what are the roots of the Putin's populism. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, um, we have been here. We have been talking a lot about Putin, uh, about Putin and European integration. Uh, perhaps <laughs> uh, Putin should be uh, rewarded as the European of the Year award, since he has made a, a big effort to make European Union unite again uh, and to give a sense of purpose for the European Union at the moment. I mean, this goes back to the to the. Uh, very first ideas of the European integration that that European Union is about peace and and definitely today we see this more clearly than than for a long period of time um, about immigration immigration uh, has been a, been a taboo subject in Europe for many many years and it is a difficult subject to to tackle indeed. Uh, and and this, uh, this, this has something to do with the internet age as well, because these new populist movements, as, as uh, Podemos, for example, is a good example of it, uh, have been able to use internet to, to speak about immigration. And they are the, the Finns in Finland, for example, Swedish Democrats in Sweden, are spreading their own ideas are the, about uh, negative aspects of migration, immigration uh, uh, to their supporters. And at the same time, the, the mainstream parties have been uh, rather reluctant to, to take up that issue because they are afraid of popular backlash. And I think that, that this, this, this time is now over. I mean, we have the, pop, uh, the, the political parties in Europe uh, the politicians have to make the case for immigration, and this goes also to the, to the enlargement of Europe, because the enlargement of Euros ha has got the, 
uh, undesired by effect of, of, of talk about Polish uh, workers going to the United Kingdom, for example, or Romanian refugees coming to Finland, be, uh, Romanian and Bulgarian beggars coming to Finland. And this is ex these are exactly the kind of rumors that, that, that uh, you know, give uh, credi credi uh, credibility to populist parties if the, the uh, mainstream political parties somehow try to hush it up. Well, I would start with saying that uh, we look closely at our editorial team we, uh, at Deliberative Democracy. We're a great fan of the concept. It's it's an uh, interesting concept, but um, the, the biggest uh, challenge there is always what do you deliver with that? I mean, the, when you see at the level of participation in the EU election, when you look at the um, also, the results of some deliberative process uh, being taken with when EU institutions open up to the public, uh, what then do you do with these votes and engagement of the public? This is questionable because uh, th there is, there is uh, some sort of a gap. I, I'm not going to call it democratic gap or whatever gap, but there is a gap between what, what, how many people don't actually participate as one thing, and how many in any of these democratic processes and elections, and then uh, what EU institutions deliver according to the consultations that are being conducted by, the, by, by Brussels. And this is overall a, a good thing to try and to, to engage in a dialogue, but then politicians and the, not even politicians, the institutions, um, and it's a question how democratic the EU institutions are uh, themselves, because they are representatives of representative democracies. Uh, how, how much they need to, um, to be engaged in democratic process when we have uh, national uh, governments in place. That's a question, I'm hard, hard to answer. But there are interesting facts to, 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 to answer again. The youth unemployment of 30 million overall uh, around Europe, uh, that's a rough number, but it's a, I think it's a fair estimate. Today is, is a bigger challenge than engaging them simply in direct democracy. I think they're pretty much engaged through Facebook and so on, except that they do Facebook more than, um, <coughs> than work. Um, uh, the, so, so the question of social capital engagement in democracy, there are in important questions, and, uh, but I think they should be kept at proportions. Uh, when the, really the institutions that are representative uh, and they're elected in a representative manner, can really deliver and respond and then be accountable uh, in front of the people that, that selected them. So these proportions, the subsidiarity level perhaps, uh, one of the principles of EU, should be, uh, should be reminded here as, a, as one of the principles I, I meant at the beginning. And then just a short remark about the uh, the danger, because uh, you were mentioning about the uh, insignificance of the populist parties overall in, the, in, in Europe. Well, I'll just... Well, I wouldn't I, say I, insignificant, I, I, okay, but okay, yes, but, but yes, I, I see your point, yes. Um, but then again, uh, recent cases uh, that uh, we've seen with one of the Hungarian parties, Jobbik, being basically infiltrated by uh, foreign, uh, I mean Russian, uh, security agencies uh, and uh, at the European level, at the national level, that uh, is a problem. The pro the un another problem is, again, not um, not uh, following the principles when it comes to national politics and friends with uh, now uh, a candidate, a potential candidate for uh, presidential elections leading in the polls, uh, breaking the rules, so to say, of sanctions and meeting uh, with uh, Marine Le Pen and meeting with a representative uh, of, of, of a Russian parliament who was banned but he used some uh, some trick, let's say, uh, in order to, to make a pu public sma statement in France. He was banned from entering the France. Uh, so these are, uh, these are the dangers that come out of uh, the, the parties uh, or uh, movements that, uh, that are bred uh, because of hy hypocrisy uh, that was earlier in place. And uh, following the comment on the, on the, you know, why do we talk about EU and uh, or why do we criticize or, or relate to Russian uh, um, populism there and why don't we focus only on EU um, problems? I actually do follow, uh, I mean, I do focus on EU problems, but I think there is uh, um, 
uh, this relates, it has a, a lot of relationship on to, 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 to Russia. Russia has been closed and the Russian uh, audience has been closely looking at EU. I, I mean, in Russia, um, where I also have my, part of my family there, they all are interested in what's going on in EU. And then the, the communication, the, uh, the language, basically lies that we hear in the Russian television about what is going on amplify simply the, the issues that we are talking about here because they, they are amplified and abused in, uh, in the rhetorics of Putin later on um, against uh, the, the principles uh, of, of Europe. Thank you. Madam President? I'd like to respond to the Swedish gentleman's commentary about migration and movements of population. Um, such movements, and when I, I'm talking about massive movements, are usually caused uh, uh, by one or, t uh, or both uh, of two different factors. One is fleeing from an unbearable situation, uh, a political system uh, that uh, uh, people find unacceptable, uh, or simply a war zone uh, which they wish to escape. And the other is the attraction uh, of the country to which they move, uh, because of the uh, largely economic, but also, I think, social <coughs> and general uh, well-being uh, situation that they offer. I happen to be of the generation that uh, my parents took me into exile, and I was part of that roughly 7 million uh, Eastern European uh, refugees who had fled from communism and who were largely concentrated in the uh, three uh, occupation zones uh, of uh, conquered Germany and uh, put into refugee camps for several years and kept there. And I must say that countries like Sweden and, uh, and Switzerland, which had managed to stay outside uh, of the Second World War, uh, guarded their frontiers with as much jealousy as Peter ever guarded the, the, the entrance to paradise in heaven. Uh, they, they were extremely, extremely reluctant to accept uh, refugees, and indeed so were other countries in Europe. Uh, Britain wanted only uh, strong young women uh, to work as assistant nurses in hospitals, uh, or um, and Belgium and Britain offered single men uh, to work in the mines. Uh, families with small children were not welcome, uh, and uh, as a result, uh, shiploads of uh, refugees then uh, took off for where? For the New World, for Australia, uh, for Brazil, and for some of the colonies uh, of the European countries. The European countries, after the Second World War, were absolutely uh, reluctant and unwilling and economically unable to receive that flood of refugees. Let's fast forward a few years later. All of a sudden, the economy had developed. The Marshall Plan took effect. Europe was short of, uh, of um, workforce and uh, started accepting immigrants from uh, Turkey in the case of Germany, from the former colonies uh, in the case of Britain or France. And then certainly in Britain and France, you had the revengeance of the colonized who came back in large numbers uh, in the case of France, uh, from especially North Africa, with also Sub-Saharan Africa, and for uh, Britain from Pakistan and other countries of the sort. These people then faced the problem of um, uh, economic integration and social integration and also the fact of, a, if you like, a clash of civilizations coming frequently uh, from um, backgrounds very substantially different in their customs, in their values, from those of their host countries. Whereas those seven million refugees who were kick, basically kicked out of Europe by the Europeans, uh, by those wonderful democratic European nations of the time, you know where they went? They went to the New World. They went to Canada, to Australia, to the United States, and they were welcome. They were welcomed as bringing in fresh blood, uh, fresh talent, um, a workforce. Uh, they flourished, uh, they developed, uh, they benefited from it. And Europe somehow has never gotten over that post-war feeling that people who come in from abroad are always a, a menace and a danger because it, Europe is the old world. And I'm sorry to say, after spending much of my life, in fact, most of my life in the new world, uh, and also some of it uh, in Africa, uh, I think that this old world mentality of Europe is a bit of a, of a hurdle uh, in facing up to the modern world, the new world, which is very much a mobile one, uh, where people move around and where we really have to work hard in developing social models that will be inclusive and able to accommodate rather different backgrounds and rather different roots in society. 
Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, we've heard, we're coming to the, uh, to the end. Um, we've heard many things, including about a vacuum that needs to be addressed, that people feel one, um, that uh, we need to restore confidence in the European project, uh, that we need better policies, that we should stop playing Brussels for all of our problems. Of course, Mr. Putin couldn't remain out of this discussion and the infectiousness of populism. Um, the idea of that it might be useful for politicians and governments to be honest, that people might appreciate honesty uh, when they are talked to, to keep Europe open. Uh, we heard about the relationship between uh, economics and a sense of identity and the security of the future. Uh, and in the uh, end, we've heard about the mobility and the need for social models to accommodate this uh, mobility. There are many, many other questions, including one that I just, and I'm going to just throw that out because we don't have enough time for it. You can ruminate on that. Um, and the question from cyberspace is, does social media participation genuinely contribute to participatory democracy? A very good question, and we could talk about that one separately, but we won't. But I would like to allow, because we have precisely two minutes, but I'm going to spread it to four minutes, uh, I would like a last Twitter comment to, 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 from each of our panel participants. Um, and my, my, my question, but they can say what they think the important thing is, is what should Europe's uh, politicians and leaders do to regain people's trust? And I've listed a few things that were suggested, but, but perhaps there are more. But I would like to give one minute to each person to give a Twitter comment about uh, what they think is most important in this topic. And we'll start again with Ambassador. Thank you. So I will be brief. Uh, what I believe is uh, the best uh, answer to every dilemma is truth and honesty. So let us all, our politicians, us, be precise whatever we are saying. So when we talk about uh, uh, things, let's be black and white. Don't leave a gray zone because gray zone invites populists, invites skeptics, invites all demons uh, in Europe and outside of Europe. Be precise, be blunt, and be very, very honest. Thank you, Ambassador. Please. Okay. Um, Mr. Lytle. I try to be very brief. What the European Union can do, I think, and politicians, European politicians in general can do, they should tackle difficult political issues such as migration, make the case for migration and European enlargement. Uh, uh, the second, second point is the social inclusion. They, we should make sure that Europe is good for everyone in Europe, not only the, uh, the people who already are doing pretty well. Uh, what comes to the I said that, that populist parties are not as a big threat as sometimes imagined. I say, uh, they generally speaking, they have three, at least three deficiencies. They have lack of organization, such as Podemos, or, uh, Podemos movement, as, uh, for example. They have an inability to cooperate with, with each other, as seen in the European Parliament. Uh, and they lack issues in many cases, lack issues beyond immigration and general distrust of the European Union, which, is, which makes them, them weaker. Thank you. Mr. Przybilski, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for trying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Wojciech. Przybilski. <laughs> Now I think uh, when we uh, when we talk about pop uh, politics, uh, do remember that populism is an essential part of any political party, be it liberal, whatever. There is a d small degree of populism that is always essential. You can't have politics without it. It's about popular vote. Populism is inscribed there. 
But um, I would very much ag agree with these comments on truth and honesty, but I won't repeat them. So uh, think about uh, this Twitter comment. <laughs> uh, don't, ma uh, don't make promises you can't deliver and have dignity to leave if we don't. Thank you. And Madam President. I would remind the, the citizens of Europe that we did have a French Revolution which left rather a mark uh, on our continent. And uh, when people talk about politicians as if they were somehow a different race from them, I'd remind them that ever since the French Revolution, this is not the case. If before we had the absolute divine right of kings and the absolute divine right of the aristocracy to be better than anybody else and to rule over them by uh, virtue of their birth, ever since we have been saying, you and I, are equal uh, before the law uh, and before the Lord, if you like. And that means that when you give your trust or when you empower uh, certain persons in a representative democracy to act on your behalf, do remember they do not, because of that fact, become a different species of animal from you. They're still part of the homo, homo species or a sapiens species. They're still part of the nation and the society that formed them. And the virtues and the defects that you will see in them are really a mirror of who, what you are yourself. And also remember that hopefully they are not put there for life, although some seem to be. And uh, uh, they are replaceable. They are renewable. Uh, we recycle them. So. Um, this being the fact, do not despair. If you do not like one, choose another, and let's go merrily on ahead. <laughs>